Bismillah, alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salam ala rasulillah, amma ba'd. Let's dive in. Uh, so I think uh, a few um, general points here is that this is going to be an assault on your senses for about, I think, 30 to 40 minutes. So the, the uh, I guess the attitude you should take with this is akin to one going to uh, a hot Turkish bath and just, you know, just letting whatever happens to you happen to you. Um, and you, you might be going in for the first time, so you don't know that this Turkish dude is going to turn up and he's going to do this to your ear or something. Just just let it go and just ex enjoy the experience. Uh, you're not going to rem remember all of this, but by the end of it, inshallah, you will come out with um, a lot of, by osmosis, hopefully you'll have picked up a lot of things. Uh, but more importantly, you will know roughly the kind of areas that you need to be drilling down more into uh, afterwards. So why do we care about this stuff in the first place? Uh, there's a hadith. I'm sure that you probably have heard this hadith because of the theme of this um, uh, conference already. Uh, so it's a hadith of Ibn Mas'ud where Rasulullah he said, the son of Adam will not be dismissed from his Lord on the day of resurrection until he is questioned about five issues, his life and how he lived it, his youth and how he used it, his wealth and how he earned it and he spent it and he, how he acted in his uh, knowledge. Um, and so, of course, we're focusing in on the wealth and how you earned it and spent it aspect today. Um, and I think that, you know, there's a much broader issue here that is really important to, um, you know, drill down on. And, and I think part of this is because of the university experience, right, um, where you have, uh, I, I find often you have practicing Muslims who are perhaps not, uh, you know, and, and you have non-practicing Muslims or, you know, you have non-Muslims and the kinds of people that you see who are really into finance and investment and careers and the corporate world are typically speaking, the not so practicing Muslims or the non-Muslims uh, and the practicing Muslims, therefore, by contrast, you know, you, you get into this almost like, uh, you know, it is not religious or it's, it's not Islamic, you know, you start pattern matching between those who are not religious and not Islamic and those who do this stuff and saying, well, actually, that therefore, that means that, you know, whatever they are passionate about and interested in, therefore, that must mean that that is not something I can really get involved in. Um, uh, but that is a, uh, you know, is a really, really problematic approach uh, to take when it comes to investment and personal finance, but also your own careers, because all of this is integrated in, right? Because it's our relationship to money, the way it gets to us, and then the way we spend it. Um, and the reason why it's a problem is because if you look at Muslims globally, they're about 20%, at least 20% poorer than the rest of the world. Um, and then if you look at the top 100 companies in the world, um, you know, Muslims are a quarter of the world's population, right? So you would expect that of the top 100 publicly listed companies in the world, you would have um, around 25 of them being Muslim. Um, but no, you actually have, um, and perhaps, you know, someone can guess on the chat um, what they think. I'll give five seconds for someone to have a guess what the number is. How many Muslim origin uh, companies do we have in the top 100? Yep. Yeah. Well, someone's, oh, yep. Yeah. Uh, so the answer is one, uh, and the and the answer um, is Aramco, which is the Saudi oil company. So it's not like they've um, you know necessarily earned it or created it; it's just oil. And the the problem that we have there is that the co other other companies in this list include people like Microsoft, uh, Google, Netflix, Amazon, possibly even Zoom now. Uh, and, you know, these are the companies that we have already had a touch point about five or six times already today. Uh, and this is a weekend. Uh, and so you can imagine the amount of power and influence and um, value that these companies add to the world. And Muslims are nowhere to be seen. Uh, and this is at heart a problem of um, finance and investment and innovation. Um, so when Muslims say, uh, when a practicing Muslim says, uh, brother, this is uh, this is not a field for a practicing Muslim. You must, you know, just earn the minimum that you can, and then you must focus on the the ibadah aspect um, and the and your deen. That is completely misunderstanding what our religion is all about, because our religion is not a religion that you leave at the door when you go and earn your nine to five, um, you know, daily living that's not our religion because if that's your our religion then 20 you know 20 years of your life will be spent uh with your religion lying at the door 
um, our religion is an all-encompassing all one, and it includes both where, where we live and where we work, uh, and also where we spend our money. And then finally, right, um, it's quite an easy sell, <laughs> this topic, because it makes you money, uh, and it actually is good for you individually. Uh, so not only is it good for you to make money for yourself, but also uh, for me, importantly, uh, and the reason why I do this, why I left you know, the corporate career behind, is because uh, it, you, by you individually doing well, uh, it massively helps the Muslim community as a whole. So think of it like this way, right? Um, actually, let's let's dive into the talk and I'll, I'll bring out the point uh, in a later slide. So four objectives, um, learn the full uh, tier framework of personal finance, learn three essentials of investing, have a basic grasp of the five main investment categories, and then go away with two key action points minimum. So uh, introduction to IFG. Um, so we are an Islamic finance analysis, review, comparison platform. Uh, we create lots of content and we, uh, we started about five, 2015, so about five years ago now, um, as uh, a blog, which just you know, put out lots and lots of different content on Islamic finance uh, as part of my own journey of learning. And uh, during the course of that, we, we realized that you know, this is stuff that people actually really need to know a lot more about. And this was all done part-time alongside our corporate careers. Um, and Alhamdulillah, now we get a fairly large audience um, and you know, we've, got a, we've obviously built out the team and um, you know, made it a bit more um, financially sustainable, what have you. Uh, but overall, the mission here uh, is two things. We ultimately want to get Muslims wealthier. We want to help Muslims get wealthier. And how do we do that? Uh, and, and why do we do that? Why do we do that? We've already covered, but for us specifically, we think that if you can make Muslims wealthier, then you help health outcomes, education outcomes, income inequalities, um, underrepresentation in uh, media and politics, overrepresentation in prisons, um, you know, the lack of representation of Muslims in the top 100, 200 companies. You, you change all sorts of different things if you do that. Uh, and we think that there are two key ways that you help achieve that goal. The first, is um, by helping Muslims sort out their personal finances. So you and I, if all of us have, um, you know, think of it like this, there is the Muslim, this is the Muslim population. They all have some money in their pockets. And then there is money outside of the Muslim population. So the two ways that you can increase the money within the Muslim population is by taking the money you have and making it more. And then the other way you can increase it is by taking the money that is in the Muslim population and bringing it into the Muslim population. So sorting out your personal finances helps you take the money that you have and making it more. Uh, and then becoming an entrepreneur and supporting the next big entrepreneurs and creating Muslim com you know, led companies takes money that is outside in the population, uh, wider world, and brings that into the Muslim fold. So think you know, if Jeff Bezos was a Muslim, for example, suddenly all of his worth would be within the Muslim community. And the ripple effect that you see from that is absolutely enormous. And we see you know, some fairly large um, companies nowadays, alhamdulillah, who have Muslim founders and the, and the real impact that they have, uh, I see personally as, you know, as someone who's in the, um, the startup community and uh, who talks to lots of entrepreneurs and founders regularly, you see the, 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 the impact that these people have in the background as uh, so we need more of that. So essentially that's kind of what we, what we do. The first thing that we do is we help Muslims sort out their personal finances, which is what this session is all about and education um, and, uh, and finding halal investments and you know, getting, getting you sorted on the property ladder, et cetera. And the second thing that we do is through ifg.bc, which is our angel syndicate, which invests in early stage uh, companies and um, hoping to become the next big things. So we give uh, investment into those companies as well. But we don't, we, we're not really going to talk too much about that side of things today. So uh, what is personal finance? Any thoughts? Uh, feel free to uh, ping it away in the chat what you think. What do you think is uh, personal finance? This slide was actually as well. Aha, uh -huh, okay. Well, there's a, there's a slido as well. Let's see what comes up. So guys, if you'd prefer to re uh, reply on this Slido screen, uh, all you do is go into the Slido website, as it says, and just enter that code. Or you could do sli.bo slash ffu. Uh, <laughs> 
Okay, I think people are replying in the chat, which is fine. Uh, paying off students, how you handle your finances. Great. Yeah, all of those are sensible um, suggestions. Um, yeah, yeah. So there's, there's no real one, I guess, definition. Jazakal khair for that. There's no real one definition um, of uh, personal finance, uh, but it encompasses a whole bunch of those different things. Um, and what you're trying to achieve uh, can you see my screen still, by the way? No, sorry, you mean you should just quickly read through that. Ah, okay. No worries. Hopefully you should be able to see it now, right? Yeah. Great. So, yeah, personal finance, if you do it well, it can completely set you free. Uh, and in a nutshell, um, as uh, you know, a lot of you said in, in, the, in the contribution you just made, it's basically how do you manage your money affairs, the incomings, the outgoings, um, what are your priorities, how are you going to allocate your money, both in the short term, in the long term, and also importantly, what are you trying to maximize here? Because uh, I think a goal-based approach is a key thing that people um, sometimes just lose sight of, and that's why uh, they suddenly uh, go haywire. It's like getting into a car and not knowing your destination. Uh, even if you have a really nice car, you know, if you don't know what your destination is, you're, uh, it's kind of useless. So, um, you know, a goal-based approach always makes a lot of sense. So on to that topic then. So what are the, you know, high level four key goals that you should have in your uh, personal finance life? The first thing is to sort out your own budget, make sure that you're, um, you're saving some money, ideally, or at least breaking even every, um, every month. The second thing you should do is clear your debts because debts have a nasty habit, habit of mounting up. Uh, and then if, especially if you've got credit card debts and what have you, then that you know, adds interest uh, and that really can, can start snowballing. The second thing you should do is look to have three to six months worth of uh, a savings buffer. Uh, and that means you, know, you look at how much do you actually need to live? Let's say it's a thousand pounds or 2000 pounds per month. Then that means that let's say it's a thousand pounds, you need 3000 to 6000 pounds saved up in a liquid um, savings account. That's that what that means is it needs to be in an investment that is quickly accessible uh, because otherwise it's not really an emergency fund, is it? Uh, so you need it to be in a liquid investment. So a liquid investment would be something like, um, you know, stocks and shares or uh, gold uh, or even uh, Bitcoin, although I wouldn't necessarily uh, recommend that for your emergency pot, because you want it to be something fairly uh, boring and stable that will actually still be there, uh, broadly speaking, when you need it. Uh, and then um, the, the third thing that you should do is stop renting. So, you know, as you get older, you, you'll probably, you know, start renting, you'll probably potentially look to get married and, you know, set up your house and you might want to ultimately buy a house. Now, the reason why renting is such a bad thing, generally speaking, is because you are just giving away money, right? Every month you're giving away a thousand, thousand five hundred pounds, uh, and that quickly adds up. So it adds up to roughly, uh, we, we ran, we've got a calculator on our website called the Should You Buy or Rent Calculator, which you can access on islamicfinanceguru.com. And you run the numbers, and over the, over the next 25, 30 years, if you um, rent instead of buying, you will be roughly three to four hundred thousand pounds worse off. Um, so it, it's like a bit of a no-brainer. And for us, you know, where we're on a mission to help Muslims get wealthier and make they make the 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 wealth in the Muslim community grow, for us that's such a you know own goal. If you continue renting, so the alternatives there are that you then have to get yourself onto the property ladder, um, and that means um, you know an Islamic mortgage or you pay, pay in cash or you know, you, you do whatever you need to do to make that work. And, with, you know, we, that's a whole separate topic. I, want, I don't really want to go into that just at the moment because this is more about investment. But that's the goal that you should have. And then the final thing, once you've achieved that, once you, you know, you've got yourself a house, you've got yourself a three to six month buffer, then you're ready to really do the interesting stuff, which is build a diversified portfolio that achieves your investment goals. And those goals could be, I want to get my kids uh, through university. Th those goals could be, I want to save X amount up so that I can retire early. Uh, those goals could be, I want to, um, you know, save this much up so that I can quit and do my own uh, thing uh, and, you know, use that to set up my own business. Whatever it is, uh, you need to have that in mind in order for you to be able to then decide 
what is the right thing for you to be investing in. Uh, I think we're okay for time. Spending matrix. So two broad categories that you are in and the two broad questions that you should be asking yourself. If you are skint, you should ask yourself, do you need it? And can you afford it? Uh, if you are not skint, you should ask yourself, will I use it? Is it worth it? Uh, those are, I think, you know, it's very simple questions, but uh, sadly, I think a lot of us don't necessarily always ask that uh, to ourselves. I do remember my brother when he was in, actually, to be, to be honest, even when I was at university, uh, there, there is a slippery slope that you can go down uh, and, you know, you've been given money for the first time and uh, that chicken cottage or that whatever it is uh, starts looking more appealing than cooking for yourself or, uh, you know, you might splash out on some random clothes that, you know, you don't necessarily need. And, uh, and those are the kinds of things. And, and actually at university, you're, you're more skinned than not skinned, really, if you think about it, because uh, a lot of you may have student loans. So you definitely don't want to be spending any more from your student loan than you absolutely need both from a financial prudence perspective, but also from an Islamic perspective, because a student loan should only be ever used as a last resort. So um, spending savvy, uh, really quickly, you know, do a direct debit health check every so often, make sure you're not giving money randomly to things that you don't really use anymore. Uh, fixed spending, can you get it cheaper? So energy, broadband, phone, have a, like a six month check-in on these things because that can add up quite significantly. Uh, over time. And you might think, oh, well, what's the point of saving 10, 20, 30, 50 quid a month? Well, the reason is because um, you, there's a compounding effect where, you know, that 50 quid, you invest that in 20 years time, that becomes thousands of pounds. Uh, and if you, you know, you just keep, keep on making those marginal gains regularly, that then has a really big impact on your well-being and also the community's well-being long term. And variable spending, uh, you know, can you control it? Would you be better off spending a discretionary uh, spending uh, limit? So if you if you set yourself a goal that I'm not going to necessarily go over this, then that could be a good way of, um, you know, getting sorted. I won't go into this slide too much, but this is just to give you a sense of how important personal finance and thinking about money is throughout your entire life. So from birth, if you put if your parents put putting putting money into a children's sit or a junior ISA or something like that, even if it was just like fifty quid a month, then today you probably wouldn't have had to take out a student loan. Um, that's pretty, you know, that's pretty emphatic. Like something boring and simple as that can have such a lasting impact on um, you know your personal circumstances. So don't make that mistake with your kids. The second thing is. Uh, university itself, try to avoid student loans. I've made a video on it on YouTube, which you can find. Um, but if you have to, then of course, you know, you have to, I'm not saying, you know, don't go to university and, uh, you know, uh, start begging on the streets if you can't get a student loan. Um, uh, sorry, if you can't pay for university yourself. You should try and work though during university. I think it has a really beneficial impact on uh, your own CV, but also it reduces the need for uh, a student loan. I actually think that getting... Um, uh, you know, gap years during university, one or two gap years and doing something interesting in that and getting paid for it is a great way of spending your time. Uh, in your first job, make sure that you have a pension because that's free money that the employer is giving you, which you're not taking if you refuse it. And there are uh, Sharia compliant pensions out there. Um, I, I won't go into that in too much detail, but again, all of these things have an article on our website. Um, marriage costs around um, 35 to 45,000 um, and Muslims, they, uh, you know, they are the worst culprits when it comes to the set the investment, the, the amount of money they spend on marriages. I think it was um, the numbers really back of uh, napkin kind of numbers that I ran Muslims constitute maybe about 20 to 40% of the sorry, not 40%, 20% of the entire mar uh, mar marriage spend and they're only 5% of the population. So we do like to splash out on our marriages. Now, instead of that, if we were, if we were quite simple about it, then that suddenly uh, materially sets up that couple for the rest of their life. Um, instead, we blow it on Bentleys and um, Rolls Royces for the day, which I, I mean, for personally, I think they're quite tacky as well. I mean, if you don't own a Bentley, you don't, you're not rich enough to own a Bentley, then what's the point of driving it for a day? But anyway, that's a, that's a side point. 
Um, and then with your first house, obviously we've talked about that already, get on, get, get onto the, the property ladder. Uh, and then with your spare, spare cash, I think taking a bit more risk is a good thing. Like you shouldn't be risk averse. Um, you know, investment is a decision that you have already taken the first time you get some money in your account. Because when you um, have money in your account, that is an investment decision. You have just decided to allocate 100% of your portfolio to cash. And that's a bad idea because we have inflation uh, and that eats away at your um, money about one to two percent a year. Also, we've got zakat, which is about two and a half percent. So if you leave about 50,000 pounds in a bank account um, over um, 10, 10 or so years, that 50,000 becomes about 18,000 uh, by the end of those 10 years. Whereas if you invested that in quite a broad range of things, that would become about 200,000 uh, on average over the next 10 years. So uh, make sure that you, you know, you actually take an investment decision because you, uh, you already have done if you haven't taken one, if that makes sense. And then finally, you should get yourself an Islamic will. Um, at this stage of your life, if you don't have that many assets, um, then I would suggest that you just get a free will. Uh, but once you have a little bit of assets, you might be married, you might have kids, um, you might have a little bit more savings. At that point, I would suggest you uh, check out the market. I mean, we do IFG wills as well, but um, you know, you check out the market and uh, you make sure you get yourself a will. The reason why is A, because it's uh, a religious obligation. Um, and B, because if you die in the UK without a will, then your assets will be distributed according to English law, not UK, not Islamic law. Uh, so the last thing you want to do when you come in front of the almighty for the first time uh, is to turn up uh, with the last thing that you've done to be a non-Islamic will. Um, so, uh, yeah, I'd, uh, I'd strongly suggest, you know, getting that sorted. Also, later on in your life, uh, a will is a great way to save tax which is 40%, inheritance tax is 40%. So imagine you've worked hard all your life and at the end of it, you give away 40% of it back to HMRC. I mean, I could not think of a, you know, a worse uh, recipient of your 40% of your estate than HMRC. So um, you know, this is why we actually do Islamic wills. Everything we do is all about trying to help Muslims save money. And you know, I, I just think that it's uh, it's criminal if you if you don't have a will, and that ends up you having to give away uh, forty percent of your entire life earnings. And look, I don't actually care about you know, frankly, that person because he's passed away. I care about the wealth staying in the Muslim community because of the wider beneficial impact that it has. Um, so do it for do it for you know the community. Uh, three essentials of investing. So become like Waqas Buffett. Uh, which is, uh, you know, obviously a play on words of Warren Buffett, do two things, actually invest and invest like the 1%. So three essentials of investing, be consistent and regular, diversify and have long-term time horizons. Let's go into each of those in detail. So firstly, how do we invest versus how the 1% invest? So the 1% invest in a whole range of different assets, whilst we invest in very simple, uh, you know, generic assets. And actually the way the 1% invest is now accessible to a lot of us. So private equity, venture capital, you know, you can access now. Um, you know, I wouldn't suggest all of these, by the way, straight off uh, for you guys as students, but, um, you know, for your parents, I'd suggest, you know, you, you have a chat with them and, uh, you know, you get them to start thinking about their portfolio as a whole, because um, they could, they could have definitely done a lot better um, if they had managed their money a bit more like the 1% than the, the rest of us, um, you know, and they started doing that 10, 15 years ago, but it's still not too late. You, you should talk to them about that. Um, but the key thing here is look at just how much stuff these guys invest in. Um, and uh, side note, uh, you know, I, I, my previous life, I used to be a venture capital and, and private equity funds formation lawyer. And I actually used to work on, um, funds where you know we we saw uh, we've been, been involved in deals where three of the top ten uh, richest people in the world were investing. So you actually get to see you know exactly how uh, the you know Bezos family office or the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation or whoever it was I think it was Zuckerberg oh no it was Larry Page uh, the Google, Google guy um, how they're investing and they're investing in things that you know you guys and ordinary folk have often not even heard of. Um, and, you know, they're doing it because uh, it just makes them more money. 
right? So, um, and, and it, all of this stuff is now accessible to all of us. Uh, and, you know, if you go on the website, you'll find out a lot more about these uh, niche areas as well. The second thing uh, that if you go back is be consistent and regular. Uh, look at Warren Buffett. Our man uh, started at 14, uh, 10K by the age of 19, which is, you know, it's not that far off where you guys will be, 10, 20K. Um, and, and then he just plugged away. And many of us, you know, Muslims, we get to about 43 and we're thinking, all right, we've got about four kids now, 34 million in the bank. Let's kick back. Let's get a mustard set up where we can be on the head of the committee and we'll chill out. But no, Warren Buffett didn't do that. He carried on. And uh, you can see that that had a, an impact. So, you know, this is the, the value of diversification. Sorry, this is the value of compounding consistent and regular, consistent and regular. It really adds up. Stock markets over 20 years. So the reason why you should um, you know, invest and just you know, be long term is because the stock market is generally heading upwards and you know, markets generally head upwards. Uh, this is because of inflation, but also because of you know, the way our money supply works. But you know, uh, long story short, investing for a long term period of time is generally uh, going to reward you. Now, five main investment categories, and just conscious of the time as well, and maybe I want to leave like three minutes for a little bit of the Q&A. So feel free to perhaps, you know, send in any questions you might have. Um, stocks, you've got a few different options. You can go completely, I don't want to deal with this at all. I just want to give my money to someone. That's Wahid Invest or uh, Awaz or uh, Sarwa or um, you know, there's a bunch of those guys out there. All of these guys, by the way, you'll find on the website on the comparison engine. Um, that's option two here. The option one is, you know, you've got 100K in the bank and you want a professional to manage it. That's a financial advisor. And then option three is you want to DIY it uh, and then you do it yourself. And then option four is, you know, you get a little bit of stock exposure anyway uh, via your pension. Sukuk. So Sukuk uh, are an Islamic version of bonds, and you can get access to that broadly in the same way. Um, or, uh, and the, the only difference here is that sometimes in the IFG.bc syndicate, we might send around some deals uh, related to Sukuk as well. Property, you can do it yourself. You can uh, invest in other companies that do it. Uh, you can uh, invest in, on, uh, in uh, you know, listed funds that do it. You can uh, get your own property by getting an Islamic mortgage. You can use property crowdfunding. I won't go into in this in too much detail, but there's a whole plethora of resources that you can do that. And actually maybe if, uh, I don't know, someone gets the moment to just share in the chat. Uh, we've got a whole bunch of one-on-one -on -one guides uh, on our website, um, perhaps I can dig it out as well, uh, where we just list out, you know, one-on-one -on -one guide on property, one-on-one -on -one guide on stocks and all these different things. Uh, that, that'll be a good read if you want to go into in, uh, in a lot more detail on these. Savings accounts are very, very boring. I mean, I, just, I almost fall asleep when I say the word savings account, but uh, if you want to park your money away for a, like a six month, 12 month period, and you don't really want that money to disappear, then the savings accounts are nice in the sense that they will at least keep it safe from inflation. And of course, you should use an Islamic bank rather than a mainstream bank. Great. And then you've got private companies. This is stuff that is uh, very exciting for me because this is stuff that I'm personally involved in, but also this is where you know, it's really high impact as well, because where, when you give money over into a stock fund, you're putting your money into Johnson & Johnson or Pfizer or, you know, uh, whoever it is, General Electric, and they then benefit from you in investing in their stocks. Whereas if you invest in startups, especially with startups with Muslim founders, um, or you, you know, get involved in SME financing, where you give uh, your money over to be loaned out in a Sharia compliant way to um, SMEs, and they then use that to grow. When you do the, these two things, v VC and debt investing, when you do these two things, you actually materially pump money into uh, you know, the, the grassroots of, of the Muslim uh, entrepreneurial and investment uh, ecosystem. And then that has the potential to become massive uh, and, you know, obviously you benefit because of the investment, but more importantly, um, the, the whole thing grows because we now have uh, a much wider, um, you know, pool of cash because a large company in the Muslim community is only a good thing. 
So there we are, guys. Uh, so we've just been talking a lot about uh, sorting out personal finance today and how we can get ourselves wealthier. Um, I will suggest to you uh, two things. The first is that you should uh, subscribe to our um, mailing list. And then the second thing you should do is you should, we've got our Telegram groups going as well uh, right now where we allow people, where there's hundreds of people on there, uh, mashallah, many of them more knowledgeable, far more knowledgeable than I am. And uh, they can, uh, they'll point you in the right direction on lots of different things. Uh, and I'm wondering if there's a way for me to share the link with you guys uh, on this, because I've got the links here. I'll just share the links. So yeah, it's, um, it's all kicking off on these Telegram groups. I've, I set them up. I didn't realize how active they'd become. Um, and uh, but it's, it's, it's plenty of good fun. So I think I've got possibly one minute for Q&A. Um, I'll answer the first one. Uh, oh, I think it might be a little bit longer. Um, we, we had a slight delay. Uh, so I think don't worry, inshallah, we'll, if, we're, if we're over time, we'll, we'll, we'll tell you to start. Okay. I think we might get kicked off automatically when the time ends. I think that's how the breakout rooms work. So don't worry, inshallah, it should be fine. No worries, no worries at all. I am uh, uh, I'm a married man. I'm used to being pushed around, so it's fine. Um, are we allowed to purchase Bitcoin? Uh, you are allowed to purchase Bitcoin. Uh, it's perfectly sure compliant. Whether or not it's a good idea, you should, uh, um, you know, obviously uh, do your own research into. We are, you know, inshallah, we're producing a lot of content around Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies generally, and we'll be doing a lot more of that as well. Um, it's something I haven't personally invested in. Mohsin, my co-founder, has. Um, so uh, when we have a video coming out on our YouTube channel, very shortly on Bitcoin, A, whether or not it's halal and the, you know, the various different arguments there, B, um, you know, whether or not it's a good idea to invest in it at all. And then three, if you do invest in it, how should you invest in it? Um, so you know, watch out for that, inshallah. Um, pensions cost a lot, not sure I will live that long. Um, yeah, sure, that's true. But then the, you know, the, the question I have for you is, uh, you know, you also don't want to get to your pension age at 65, 67. And, you know, you, you then have, you know, no quality of life uh, because you don't have any money and you're having to rely on other people uh, and you're just a net drain on, um, you know, the, the whole, uh, you know, the whole country as well, because you're, you know, you're the, you'll be the kind of guy who's sat in the NHS now because you're older. Um, so there's a whole, you know, set of wider considerations here as well. I'm not saying, you know, put all your money into pensions, but I, th I think it's prudent to have at least some money. Uh, go and host a local meal. Yeah, great. I think you should do that. Definitely, definitely go for a cheap wedding, budget wedding. Don't go for so budget that it's like, you know, it's not really a wedding, but um, as long as everyone's happy and they're, you know, they're fed, then happy days. Uh, let's see what other questions have we got. What is a good amount of money to start investing with? Oh yeah, great question actually. Uh, and, a, and a broader point here is, you know, you're probably um, as students often, you know, you might not necessarily have a large amount of money to play with, and you're thinking, okay, so what what can I do? I think two main points to think about here. One is you know, think of your money as an investment into your investing uh, education, because the worst time to be starting off, you know, learning about investing is when you have 10K and you're married and kids at the age of about 30. Uh, and then you're like, oh, hang on, I, I have no idea what I'm doing with this money. Uh, and then you start making mistakes with that 10K. And then before you know it, um, you know, you, you, you run into trouble. The better way to do it is the way that I think, you know, uh, Alhamdulillah, I did it and, and I encourage other people to do it, which is take the little bit of money you have at the start and just start dabbling in a whole range of different things. Because quite frankly, that 1K, if you lose it all, it's not going to make a massive difference to you or your life. Um, but, the, but at the same time, you will learn a hell of a lot by, uh, by the, the whole experience of investing it. And, you know, most people will not lose that 1K either when they start uh, dabbling around in, uh, in investments. So highly recommend doing that. There's no, good, there's no uh, you know, educator 
as, as, as experiences. So really recommend that. And we've got a whole bunch of courses as well uh, on our website that you can check out. And then just, you know, by osmosis, if you're following us on our content and mailing list, you'll find out lots of different things. Um, Salam alaikum, Brother Ibrahim. Wa alaikum salam. Inshallah, we have three, four minutes left, yeah? Okay, great. Perfect. So you should keep working through your questions and uh, when everyone's kicked out, everyone's kicked out. Excellent, excellent. Inshallah. So uh, a good amount of money to start investing with just depends on how what you're investing for, right? So if you're investing in uh, stocks and shares, you can you know start with a relatively small amount of money. If you're investing in uh, more exotic things that like you know property or venture capital or uh, whatever it is, then that might need a little bit more money. So it kind of is horses for courses. Um, but I think that the key takeaway that I'd like to leave you guys with is educate yourself and you know take a few risks as well when you're when you're young because uh, that's money that you know let's say you've got three thousand pounds that three thousand pounds if it is lost. It's not really going to have a massive impact on your life, but if that three thousand becomes ten thousand or twenty thousand, then that's like Islamic mortgage deposit territory, um, which is you know a material benefit to you. Um, so uh, I guess you know you can be a bit more um, aggressive with your investments uh, early doors, uh, and then as you get older and older, uh, you have to um, pair that back uh, and uh, and just be a bit more boring. Can we invest in Forex? Uh, no, don't do that. Uh, we've done a quite a detailed video and a whole bunch of articles around that. Uh, so if you just search something like this Forex Haram or Halal or something, uh, you'll find all that. Would you recommend to start investing as a student when you don't currently have a job? Um, I think so, yeah. I, I think if, if, if you don't need that money, then there's no harm in investing, right? Because if it's just sat in cash, that is an investment decision, as I said. So um, you feel free to you know dabble a little bit. But remember, if you need a, you know a certain portion of your money to do X things, or for example, you need it to pay your fees, or you need it to you know whatever, uh, and that's important for you, then don't obviously go you know putting that into something that's high risk and illiquid, so you can't get the money out quickly. Uh, that would be um, not a good decision. What is the best, me best method of investment for recent graduates? So I think for recent graduates, you're looking at building up a, a buffer. Uh, so putting money into liquid, fairly stable investments. So, you know, stocks and shares is probably a good idea, especially Islamic funds. Um, and then after that, you can branch out and start building up your property element. You can go into, uh, you know, VC investing, uh, SME financing. You can, uh, you know, go into gold. Uh, you could go into crypt to cryptocurrency. Uh, there's all sorts of different things that you can start doing once you've got yourself a nice base. As a student with limited funds, what can we do now? I have some money from a part-time job, but I don't want to keep it in my account. Give it to me. I'm more than happy to take it. Um, but no, seriously, I think you should uh, potentially um, you know, look to put it into the stock market. Might be a good way. Uh, to get started and the re and you know you can do that by uh, someone like Wahid or uh, you can do it yourself and you could or you could you know set up a broker account and um, invest into an Islamic fund or you could you know set up just your own account and invest into individual stocks it depends kind of how invested in in this whole in endeavor of investment you want to get you know to if you want to really learn about it then obviously get a bit more hands-on you'll get a lot, lot more out of it um, but then if not, then uh, you just take the kind of hands-off approach. Will these slides be available? Um, yeah, I, I'm sure I, I can make this available. Um, I can share like a PDF or something um, with people. Actually, maybe I could do it now, perhaps. No, I'll, I'll share it afterwards, I think. Um, when do we start investing for pension? Uh, ASAP, uh, because you want that compounding uh, effect to really kick in. Are the PowerPoint, uh, yeah. Would you suggest clearing student loan debt before investing? Probably not. I think that if you did that, you'd probably not be investing until you're like 35, 40, right? By which time, you know, you've lost all your hair and, uh, you know, it's you've already eaten away that golden 20 years um, straight after graduation where you want to be investing to build up your uh, portfolio. But having said that, that doesn't mean that you just like chill out with your student loan either and like just don't pay it. 
Um, I think, you know, the, the, the muftis that I've talked to, their view was just, you know, trying to accelerate that as much as you can, but don't go completely mad and like prioritize that over everything else. Uh, for a student who doesn't have enough money for a startup, would you recommend them taking out loans straight up? No, um, I'd recommend you uh, build something uh, with nothing um, with, you know, you don't need money these days to do a startup, uh, at least, you know, initially uh, to get something growing. And then uh, once you have that, then, uh, you know, you can start, uh, you, you can start raising money and, and using that money. Uh, and that's what we did as well. We actually raised some money from angels um, to, um, yeah, uh, to do our startup. Okay, looks like we are ending.